right, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us again today. Uh, crypto Lockdown brought to you by uh, the Telefriend community, which is Bitcoin Trend of Forecast, TrendSeek, the Day Trade uh, team, and the Huddle Knots, uh, the Scalp Trade team. And we are very privileged to have Darby Root back on with us, talking a little bit about the current economical climate with COVID going on and what we can expect over the next couple of months, how's things going. And then we're going to ask Darby very briefly on what his take is on crypto. Um, as many of you on here are already part of either our scalp team, the huddle knots or the day traders, Trendsic, or the long-term trades with Marius Landman um, on that side. And then part of the to know it platform, uh, with our network tell a friend. So yes, if I may ask, don't interrupt, just keep yourself muted. Uh, if you've got any questions, raise your hand. Uh, there's a function that you can raise your hand or type your question in the text box. And then if time permits, we'll have Darby or ask Darby to, to answer those questions. And then after we've spoken with Darby, or Darby has spoken to us, we're gonna go into the market, see what Bitcoin is doing. And then if there's any questions for the Trendsic team, the TAs, then you may ask them as well. And then we'll just have a general chat. So Darby, thank you very much again for joining us. I'm gonna stop my screen share now so that people can see you and really appreciate your time uh, for talking to us on this difficult time and topic. So I'm going to keep quiet and then it's all yours, Darby. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for the invite again. It's very nice talking to you guys. The, the part that I really enjoy most is the part when we start talking to one another after, after I've said a few things. Um, the, um, I thought of uh, starting off by trying to answer the following question. And that is that people, I get so many, I don't know where this comes from all of a sudden, but I get so many people sending me emails or sending me questions asking me on whether the US dollar is going, is, it's on its way out. And apparently this is going to happen like in it's imminent. Uh, well, that's not the case. The US dollar is not going to disappear. And uh, I think it's going to be around for quite a long time. But it is important to know that in all cases in history that fiat country fiat money is always disappear eventually so the dollar is also going to disappear eventually it's just not going to happen tomorrow uh, and by uh, the reason why i say so is because and this is one part of the reason uh, part of the topic that i want to cover today is to understand how how money works in the modern environment and in the modern banking environment okay now we all know let me just go back and refresh everybody's memory we all know that money is created that's steady in modern money at least, I'm not talking about gold or other kinds of money that we had previously, but in a modern economy, money is created by a central bank creating money out of nothing. It is called, as you know, it is called fiat money, and the central bank can create money by doing two things. They can just print money, and they give it to the banks or put it into the banking system, uh, or they can credit the bank accounts of banks at the bank. And money today consists primarily of money in some in an electronic form and in fact most of the monies that we are using today is in fact already in a encrypted form so that's when we talk about so-called crypto money i prefer to rather call it private money instead of calling it crypto money but nevertheless so the process works as follows is that the central bank will make money out of nothing and then they will sell this money to a bank typically in exchange for something else and the bank will give an exchange to the bank usually a government bond instrument, a government debt instrument, as an example, some financial instrument. And there's a list of financial instruments that banks are, are central banks are prepared to take as collateral. Usually this is an overnight transaction where the whole thing is reversed the next day. Uh, and that's why it's called, in the case of South Africa, a repo or a repurchase agreement, because a bank will sell some sort of financial instrument to the central bank, and then the next day, the transaction will be reversed or repurchased. All right, so now the money ends up with the bank in a form either of cash or in a form of an electronic form at a bank. And this money that is first created by a central bank 
is called high-powered money or base money. But that's only the, whole, the starting of the process of money creation. From there on, a bank will lend out the money and somebody else will borrow it and the money will come back at the, and the, and the, in the deposit back to the bank. So the, the layers. Okay, very, very glad to see you here as well. Sorry about that. Uh, no, I'm happy to see we've got a zillionaire here as well. So, okay, so the bank will, banks will lend out the money and somebody will spend the money and it will end up back in a deposit at the bank. Now, that's the second phase of the money creation process. The central banks create the high-powered money and from there on through the credit extension process of banks lending out money and people borrowing money, that whole process then adds to the money creation process. Now, remember the original money is still there, the notes and coins, just to make it simple, uh, but it's because of the definition of money. Uh, namely, that we, we, we talk about medium term or longer term deposits. If we add all of that together, we get what usually in the case of South Africa, we, we measure the money supply measured by the, so the definition called M3, while in the case of the United States, they usually use M2. So, but it's very important to understand that, that money is created by central banks, but the real money creation process actually happens in the so called fractional reserve system, whereby banks create money. Not only banks, but people borrowing money as well. So it's not only banks that create new money, it is people borrowing money from banks that is also creating money. So that is the so-called fractional reserve system, and that's where a lot of extra money is being created. Okay, so that's how money, money system basically works today. If, uh, of course, the most dominant currency in the world today is the US dollar. Now, it's important to understand why the US dollar is the most important currency in the world. It is, for, for the obvious reasons, it is the most important currency in the world because it is the biggest economy, or depending on your definition, perhaps the second biggest economy, but it is a very deep, very big economy. And it's a bit of a fluke of, of history as well because of an agreement just after the Second World War, war called the Bretton Woods Agreement, which essentially removed the, the, the dominance of the UK pound as a world currency and the, and, um, and the, and the US dollar became the world's currency. Is it possible for other currencies, like for example, the yen or the euro, to take over the crown as the most do dominant currency in the world from the US dollar? And it certainly is possible, but for that, before that will happen, of course, the most obvious things need to happen, like the other countries need to start growing the economies to become bigger, and they have to have a very a good central bank, and people must have the necessary respect for your central bank and confidence in your central bank, but there's something else that is always also required, and that is a very deep capital market. Now, I want to spend a little bit of time on this to, to, for people to understand this, because if you understand this, the capital market behind the US dollar, then you will understand why the US dollar will remain a dominant currency for a very long time to come. Remember, a capital market consists not only of, but mostly of government debt instruments, especially in countries like South Africa and European countries, but in the case of the United States, their capital market is very, very deep and very liquid. And it's not only government debt instruments that are traded or primarily traded. In fact, uh, many, many uh, companies also borrow in the United States capital market. So it's a, in fact, it's a much bigger market, the capital market, than the equity markets. It's a huge market. And especially in the United States, it's a very, very liquid market. Now compare that to the Europeans, for example. In the case of Europe, there are various um, government debt instruments in a form of, well, various countries, like, for example, the Italians and the Greeks and whoever, they all have their government debt instruments, but it's not a single government debt instrument like what they have in the United States. In the case of the United States, they've got treasury bills known as TBs, and TBs are the most traded instrument in the world. But in Europe, they have a number of various instruments. They are not really uh, a, a united government debt instrument in Europe, and they've only recently, a week ago, have they approved the issuance of a 750 billion euro instrument, which will be, uh, will be basically the first government of Europe bond that will be issued, and it will be underwritten by all the countries in Europe. But up to now, it has been very fragmented, uh, because all the various countries issue their own government debt instruments. So the European Europe is very much fragmented as far as their fiscal accounts are concerned, but they are very much united as far as their monetary 
accounts are considered uh, because they've got one uh, one um, a currency in Europe, but uh, various government debt instruments. Okay, going back to the Americans, so they've got this huge government debt pool of instruments available in the capital market. Now, consider, say for example, South Africa exports more than what we import, and in the process we accumulate more dollars. Now, let's say Chakanyahu, the governor of the South African Reserve Bank, doesn't take these dollars and put it under a bed or something. It always, it, uh, like most other forms of money, it ends up with South Africa in some account somewhere in an electronic form. And then the Setak Nyahu will decide what to do with that reserves. In total, the forex, the total forex reserves of South African Central Bank is nearly a trillion rand. It is approximately $40 billion. That's what we have in dollars and in gold at the South African Reserve Bank. So when we export platinum and we earn dollars with that, the Reserve Bank eventually ends up with these dollars. Remember, the Reserve Bank will buy the dollars from a platinum exporting mine, as an example. So the South African Reserve Bank needs to do something with these dollars. And what they would typically do, they will take these dollars and invest it in government debt, in American government debt instruments called TBs or treasury bills. And that's the reason why the dollar is so such a dominant currency, because if you did not have a very liquid and a very deep capital market behind your currency, your currency simply will not become a dominant currency. And that's why the Euro, Europeans, why the Euro is not, not such a strong currency yet, or not such a dominant currency yet. And that is also the simple reason why the renminbi, the Chinese currency, is also not going to become a significant currency soon because they still have capital controls, cap foreign exchange regulations in, in China, like what we have in South Africa, which do, uh, does not exist or nearly in such a strict form in the United States. And that's another requirement. So you have to have a very deep capital market, which the Americans have, and you also have to not to have uh, any limitations on capital flows in and out of your market. So there's the reason why the US dollar will remain a dominant currency in the world for a very long time to come still. And what we need and what is currently happening is the Europeans are establishing a deep capital market as well. But before that happens, the dollar will remain the world's dominant currency. Another point that is important to understand is that you do not need somebody's permission if you want to use their currency. The world uses the American dollar. Even the enemies of Americans use the American dollar. Um, but if you want to participate in the capital markets of the world, then in a way, you are the Americans can somehow make life quite difficult for you, but you don't need the permission to use the currency. Maybe at this point, I can also maybe just touch on this question on whether South Africa needs an IMF loan or not. Now, let's just follow if we go and borrow to, from the International Monetary Fund, we would typically borrow, let's say, dollars from the IMF. Actually, what you borrow from the IMF, you borrow something called a special drawing right, and a special drawing right is a currency that is issued by the International Monetary Fund, but that currency is supported or backed by a basket of certain currencies, and the US dollar, of course, is the most important basket of that currency. So we will go to the IMF, and we will borrow the special drawing rights, or basically US dollars, and the dollars will flow into South Africa, and the South African Reserve Bank then will convert the dollars into rands. So, for example, the South African government We'll go to the IMF, borrow what they're planning to do now, nearly 100 billion rands worth of dollars, and they will take these dollars, give it to the South African Reserve Bank, and the South African Reserve Bank then will convert the dollars into rands and give the rands to the South African government. But before the government spends this money, of course, the money will be at the South African Reserve Bank, and as the government spends this money into the economy, the money will flow into the economy and it will become pool become part of this pool of money sloshing around in the South African economy. Just keep in mind that the South African Reserve Bank, like most other central banks in the world, always maintain a money market shortage. So they also always drain some liquidity out of the system to make sure that you force the banks to go and borrow money from the central bank. And that thing is called the money market shortage. And currently, South Africa's money market shortage is approximately, the Reserve Bank maintains that at approximately 50 billion rands every day. So imagine now, the South African government spends 
100 billion rands were uh, rands into the system because they've borrowed this money from the IMF and the South African Reserve converted that into rands. And imagine they spend this money into the economy, then all of a sudden you will have an additional 100 billion rands sloshing around in the economy, resulting in a money market surplus of approximately 50 billion rand. The South African Reserve Bank then, in order to make sure that monetary policy remains eff <clears throat> effective, will have to drain that liquidity out of the system. And they do that typically by selling government, uh, selling reserve bank instruments on which, they, of course, they have to pay a market interest rate, which is currently around about 5% or so, to drain that liquidity from the market. So although the South African government is borrowing at the IMF for 1%, the fact that the Reserve Bank needs to drain this liquidity means that the Reserve Bank will have to pay the difference, which is typically 5% uh, roughly, uh, on that money that they've drained from the system. So don't think if you borrow money at 1% from the IMF, you're going to get money cheaper. You may be getting dollars cheap, but you still have to essentially drain liquidity from the market and that, 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 that interest component will be moved to the South African Reserve Bank to the income statement of the South African Reserve Bank and the Reserve Bank eventually, uh, if they make any losses, that losses will be for the account of the taxpayer. At the same way that uh, profits of the Reserve Bank is, uh, goes to the Treasury, losses of the Reserve Bank will have to be covered by Treasury as well. In, in practice, not really because they simply keep it on an account called the Gold and Foreign Exchange Contingency Reserve Account, very long name. Gold and Foreign Exchange Contingency Reserve Account, but basically that's what it comes down to. All right, so that's the reason, that is the reason why we do not need an IMF loan because we have in excess of $40 billion worth of uh, dollars uh, at the Reserve Bank in the form of reserves, and we do not have any reason to import things and something from abroad or significantly from abroad uh, at the moment. Remember, you do not need dollars to create rands. We use rands in South Africa, and what can simply happen if we want to create more rands, you can simply change the constitution and you can tell the Reserve Bank to print more rands. And that's it. And it, in fact, many countries are doing it at the moment. In the case of Indonesia, for example, they are doing it in case the Brits even do it themselves. And also remember the South African government can simply issue more and more bonds and the bonds will go to the banks and the banks can use these bonds uh, to go and exchange it for rands at the South African Reserve Bank. So we do not need an IMF loan at the moment. You only need an IMF loan if you need to buy something in dollars or pay off another loan in dollars. All right, that's just some background on how the system works. Now, how are some of, uh, what are some of the central banks doing at the moment uh, in the world? And I, um, maybe I can just show you a graph that uh, I'm just going to open a presentation and show that on your screen. And I would like to show you a specific graph on what is happening in Reserve in the United States. If I can do that, I can just open it and I'll show you. But, uh, you, in you can now show. Yes, okay, thank you. Let me just um, uh, let me just get this and I'll show it to you. Go there. Uh, share screen. There it is. Okay, I'm not going to go through the whole thing. Um, the whole presentation, I just want to show you one graph. I just want to, can you see that, Devil? Is that fine? Sorry, I was muted. Yes, I can. Okay, cool. Okay, let me just get you the graph that matters. That's it. All right, that is the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve in the United States. Now, what is happening at the moment in the United, well, not only in the United States, but all big countries in the world, is that these central banks are creating money out of thin air and they're doing it really in overdraft. Now, this is what happened in the crisis in 2008 and 2009, and that is the amount of government bonds or treasury bills that the Federal Reserve, their central bank in America, bought during the crisis of 2008 and 2009. When they did that, that was totally unorthodox, that was totally unheard of, and many economists predicted that we're going to see very high levels of inflation which did not happen by the way, but I'll get to that just now. This is what they're doing at the moment. This is the amount, now we're talking about many, many trillions of American dollars that are being printed and created out of nothing. And the Federal Reserve goes into the financial markets and they buy government debt instruments with that. Treasury bills in this instance mostly. 
By the way, the South African Reserve Bank recently started doing the same. And in total, the Reserve Bank bought 35 billion rands worth of government bonds the past three months or so, which is significantly less than the Fed, but still the South African Reserve Bank is doing that. The reason why they are doing that, according to the South African Reserve Bank, is because there are some liquidity issues in the bond market, in the capital market. And by the way, South Africa's capital market is very, very liquid and very well regulated and very much integrated with the rest of the world. But because of the crisis, and we also see, saw the financial markets also sort of seizing up uh, during the past say, three months or so, and the Reserve Bank started buying some government bonds with the intention not to buy government bonds as such, but to provide liquidity to the capital market. So they, they feel quite aggrieved if you say that they also participate in, in quantitative easing and they're quite strong uh, on, uh, on saying that it's not quantitative easing, they're simply participating uh, and trying to get liquidity uh, to flow again, especially in the capital market. But I can tell you, once you're on that slippery slope, it can be quite difficult getting off that. But I must say the South African Reserve Bank, one of the most recent numbers, suggests that they're gradually reducing uh, their participation in the capital market. But nevertheless, some massive amounts of money have been created by the Federal Reserve in the United States. And currently, we're talking about, uh, as you can see, a huge increase in base money. Remember, this is base money. Now, why is this not leading to inflation? Why don't we see inflation or why don't we see inflation yet? And the reason why we don't see inflation yet is simply because people don't borrow money. This is base money. Banks from here on have to, has, have to lend out money to borrowers. And borrowers, of course, must be willing to borrow money. Now, that's not really happening. The past 10 years, what we've seen worldwide is people are not really borrowing money and banks are not really lending money. The same goes to South Africa. For example, the credit growth in South Africa is around about 6 7% per year. And that is how much people are borrowing more compared to a year ago, which is relatively low. In the past, it was easy. 10 years ago, credit growth in South Africa was in a region of about 20% or even 25%. And today, credit growth is significantly lower uh, than what we say, saw previously. And that's the interesting thing about monetary policy, interest rates. Monetary policy, primarily interest rate, you can, you can force people to stop borrowing money by simply increasing interest rates. But it is very difficult to encourage people to borrow money because uh, people... They will borrow more money if you cut interest rates, but if people are really, really scared, then you, you can do whatever you want to, they're not going to borrow money, even if you cut interest rates down to zero. And that is, in fact, where interest rates are internationally. In many instances, it's actually below zero. In South Africa, we've seen the repo rate being reduced to something like a 50-year low, um, at, uh, at currently at 3.5%, and there's a possibility of even further cuts. So I don't think so necessarily, but it is possible. So interest rates in South Africa are very low levels. And that's the monetary policy that you can stop people from borrowing, but it's very difficult to get people to, um, to actually start borrowing money. But there's one exception, what's been happening in the past 10 years, because interest rates are also very low. Many companies in, um, or in a rich world, especially, borrowed a lot of money, and they use this money that they've borrowed to buy their own stocks, their own equities on the equity markets in the, and in the process, they, they forced their own equity prices up and they also bought their, um, their competition or bought out other companies and so on. And they did not use borrowed money to invest that much more because that is exactly what central banks want. They want people to borrow money and to buy new flat screen TVs or to, for companies to borrow money and to invest that in new factories, for example. But that's not what's happening. What is happening in, uh, in fact, is that companies are actually borrowing money, money to buy their competition or to buy their own stocks. That's what we've been seeing uh, the, last couple of, um, in the last couple of years. And in the process, equity prices have been going up. Now, exactly the same is happening now. Uh, with this crisis, central banks, like what they did previously, cut interest rates again, started issuing or buying a lot of government debt instruments. And in some instances, in the case of Japan, for example, they even buy equities. They go to their stock market and they buy... Uh, equities on their own stock market as well. Now, where is this thing going to end? I have a suspicion. I have a, su a suspicion this, that this time around, it's gonna, the, the end result is going to be slightly different. Maybe before I get to the end result, maybe I can just explain something called 
modern uh, monetary theory. It's also known as the magic money tree. Modern monetary theory or known as the magic, monet, magic money tree. Monet, uh, MMT basically tells us that any country that has got control over its own currency, like South Africa and like the Americans, can simply, instead of levying, levying taxes on its population, they can simply print money. And uh, the theory behind this is that you print money and the moment you see that inflation is picking up speed, then you print less money. Um, that's, that's, that's in essence <laughs> to how the MMT, how it basically works. It's slightly different in the case of what we have currently. Remember, currently you encourage or discourage people uh, to borrow money by increasing or reducing interest rates. While in the case of MMT, you are you, you're managing uh, inflation by printing more or less money. That's basically the difference between the two. Now, there's not much of a difference between quantitative easing and MMT. Um, and there's more and more politicians actually calling for flat out MMT. And in some instances, like I've mentioned, the, the Brits, for example, they, what they, the way they're money, uh, managing monetary policy in, in, in Britain today is very, very close to, to MMT. Can I just make another distinction between two kinds of money? And that is normal money, like let's call it central bank money. And there's another kind of money, and that is called government debt instruments, because that in a way is also money. Remember, if a central bank issues money, that is a liability uh, on the balance sheet of a central bank. If you go and look at South African currency, for example, the South African rand or 100 rand note, you will see that the South African Reserve Bank promises to pay the bearer year of 100 rand. So instead of getting gold back like in the past, today what happens is that the central bank will give you another 100 rand if you take the 100 rand back with it. The difference between 100 rand and a government debt instrument is the following. The Minister of Finance can issue government debt instruments and that the government debt instruments can be exchanged for money at the South African Central Bank as well. In most countries in the world, it works like that. The difference between a government debt instrument like a bond and a note is that on a government bond, they usually pay interest. I say usually because some of them do not pay interest. And usually there is an expiry date on a government bond instrument. And I say usually because you get government bonds instruments that never expire. So there's a very small difference between a government debt instrument and, uh, and, um, and a, a note issued by a central bank. Uh, and in fact, uh, that the, the difference is so small that one can even argue that what we have today is monetary policy and fiscal policy being mixed up in this whole thing called quantitative easing. All right. So what is going to happen in future? I think this time around, we're going to see significant inflation uh, taking hold globally. We have not seen inflation yet for the reasons I've mentioned, because people do not borrow money. Uh, but we have seen a kind of inflation, not necessarily in consumer goods, but we have seen inflation in other goods, namely in assets, uh, especially financial assets. Maybe another side note, remember when central banks lower interest rates and when they create money and they support the financial markets, the people that benefit from that are mostly banks and other financial institutions and the rich individuals that invest on the financial markets. Those, those are the people benefiting from that. But because companies do not necessarily borrow this money to invest in new factories, typical blue collar workers do not get the benefit of all this stimulation of the financial markets. And that means that rich people and connected companies and institutions like banks, they get the benefit, but people on the ground uh, don't necessarily get the benefit. And that's a very important reason why we see this increase in the haves and have-nots, this increase in inequality globally as well. Okay, coming back to what I think is gonna happen now with money. We've seen this incredible creation of base money We've seen this overlap between monetary policy and fiscal policy. When they started doing this the first time 10, 12 years ago, uh, there was huge debate amongst economists on whether the central bank should be involved in quantitative easing because quantitative easing is actually a fiscal, uh, fiscal policy. It should be left to ministers of finance and not to central banks. Uh, and today, everybody accepts that. So it's not unorthodox anymore. It's pretty much mainstream. 
And even a modern monetary theory is becoming more and more acceptable to many, many economists in the world, and of course to politicians as well. So where we were quite careful with money, and when we, we took small steps the past, before 10 years ago, the past 10 years we've seen this huge increase in experiments and it's huge increase in money supply. Not inflation yet, but eventually I believe it can spill over in inflation. Now, there, are, there could be a number of triggers that can lead to inflation. It's very easy to understand that in the South African context, so I'm going to use South Africa as an example. In the South African context, we have inflation currently around about 2%. And the, uh, part of the reason why inflation is so very, very low is because the oil price came down a lot and that pushed down the petrol price. So that is part, part of the reason. There are other reasons as well. People are being locked up. And if you're locked up, you can't go out and you can't buy stuff. People, people are losing their jobs. And if you don't have money to buy stuff, you also don't buy stuff. And very, very importantly, people are not buying new cars because they don't know whether they're going to have a job tomorrow and they feel scared and they feel uncertain. So that's the South African example. Now imagine, so the lock, uh, lockdown will eventually stop, <laughs> I hope. Uh, people will start going out again. People will gradually start buying a little bit more things and people will gradually, when they start feeling a little bit more comfortable, will start borrowing some money as well. And very importantly, the oil price has recently started going up again. And very importantly for South Africa as well, the rand will eventually come under pressure again and that will lead to some increases in imported prices of imported good, and that can gradually get this process called inflation started. Now, let me repeat that. Inflation is a process, and there are two definitions for inflation. The one definition is the continuous increase in the prices of all goods and services, and the other definition for inflation is the continuous fall in the value of your currency. When we get to a situation uh, where gradually we see inflation gradually accelerating, if, if we don't stop that process quickly, and you stop the process by increasing interest rates, if you don't stop that process quick enough, then inflation can accelerate, and then suddenly inflation becomes a huge problem. We saw that in South Africa. We saw that during the 1980s, as an example. We've had very high levels of inflation, and the only way we could stop that was by pushing interest rates to ridiculously high levels. And that's exactly what the Americans did also. They had inflationary problems in the 1970s. And by the end of the 1970s and early 1980s, they also pushed interest rates to very, very high levels. So that is the key as far as I'm concerned on the future of money and whether inflation will become a significant problem or not. There's an, addi an additional issue. I believe that is, if inflation starts picking up speed internationally, central banks will be very, very reluctant to increase interest rates. And they will be very, very reluctant to increase interest rates because politicians will put huge pressure on central banks not to increase interest rates because economies will take a very long time um, uh, to reach levels where we were before the crisis. So central banks may uh, postpone the tightening of monetary policy too much. And if they do that, then the inflation genie can be out of the bottle before they stop that. And then suddenly inflation can become a problem. Now, I'm not making any predictions on when this is going to happen. In the case of South Africa, it's easier. I believe in a 18 months, two years' time, we will see inflationary, picking, inflationary pressures building up in South Africa. And one very important reason is because of base reasons. That's the way inflation is calculated. But globally, it will probably take a little bit longer before picking up internationally. But like I've said, inflation is a process. It feeds on itself. And once it becomes a problem, it's very, very difficult uh, to get that inflationary process uh, to turn that around. And that's the reason why we've seen the gold price reaching new record levels recently. The gold price currently at the new record high level. And it is there because many of these gold bulls are saying inflation is going to become a problem. But remember, they said so 10 years ago also, and it didn't become a problem. But the gold bulls say is that it's going to become a problem if inflation becomes a problem then it's going to be good for gold. And if it's good for gold, of course, that's also the reason why it's good for typical, what we call cryptocurrencies or private, which I prefer to. Um, so where's this whole thing going to end? Uh, in the meantime, private monies or so-called crypto monies also have, uh, especially Bitcoin, established itself. It's, it's been around for quite a number of years now. It's established itself. It's uh, 
people got uh, used to it. People are so slowly building up confidence in it. And very importantly, people are start starting to use this as a payment mechanism. Remember, it's very exp expensive to move money from one country to the next country. The reason why is because banks are monopolies and banks make a lot of money out of moving money around between countries. But if you can do that via Bitcoin, it's still too expensive in my view. So if, if you can move it via Bitcoin and some of these other cryptocurrencies, which is uh, hopefully, which is cheaper in some instances, it will become more popular. So a couple of things that will be required for these private monies uh, to really establish themselves better over time will be inflation, which I believe will start showing itself in South Africa in 18 months time or two years, which may start showing itself internationally as well. And very importantly that we have to understand inflation is a process and it can suddenly accelerate. And the world central banks are doing their utmost to get inflation to take hold internationally and be careful what you, what you wish for. Maybe you're going to get that eventually. And I believe this time around, it's going to be more uh, different than what we saw previously. And this time around, we will in fact be um, capable of creating more inflation. Maybe I can just make another comment why I believe inflation will become a problem. Remember the debt levels of governments internationally is currently at record high levels, also in South Africa. We have never seen so much debt, uh, and we, at, at least since after the Second World War. And the one thing about inflation is that it erodes the value of money, but it also er it erodes the value of debt. And politicians, of course, want to get rid of all this debt because they can't borrow more money, because the capital markets will eventually not lend them more money, but politicians would welcome high levels of inflation because high levels of inflation will assist them of getting rid on some of their debt. Uh, and that's why uh, they will be, from many quarters, they will be, actually, inflation will be welcomed. Unfortunately, inflation is a horrible monster, but once it starts feeding uh, on the economy, it's very difficult to turn that around. Okay, having said all of that, so I believe that inflation is eventually going to become a problem, and part of and this uh, and for the reasons that I've that I've mentioned so far. Now I see there are a couple of questions already. That's all from my side. Now I think I will take some questions. Um, please. Awesome. Yeah, we've had one or two questions. Thanks for that, Darby. Okay. Um, uh, if that's what you wanted to me, maybe I can just make one or two comments about South Africa, about my estimates. I've just adjusted some of my economic estimates. Would you like yeah, to hear some? Yeah, please. No, the more information you can give us. Okay, so yeah, inflation, I expect inflation to be uh, much, much lower over the next couple of months, maybe even below 2%. It's not impossible for, for South Africa's inflation to go down to zero. Uh, interest rates, I think the Reserve Bank has uh, stopped. Um, cutting rates. They may cut again, but I don't think so necessarily. The economy is, my estimates is for contraction of approximately 10% this year. The second quarter's economic contraction is likely to be in excess of 30%, 30%. Three, three, uh, we're going to lose more than 2 million jobs per, per, permanently. More than 100,000 people will, 100, businesses will close their businesses permanently. Uh, we, there will be far fewer than 50,000 people dying from this virus. Um, the most, most horrible estimate, I think, is in the region of about 10,000 or so. Uh, sure. It's going to be 50,000. The reason why I say so, because I've calculated more than 300,000 people will die because of an increase in poverty over the next 10 years. So that's that number. The fiscal numbers has gotten completely out of hand. It, it will exceed 80% of GDP this year. The Minister of Finance will not be successful in turning that around. We're probably going to see a number of new taxes or at least attempts to introduce more taxes. Um, but that's not going to be enough to turn the fiscal accounts around. And I must tell you, I am very, very concerned about these high levels of unemployment and poverty, which, are, which, is, which is increasing by the day. And I'm afraid that is going to lead to some some serious social tension and even political tension in South Africa. Okay, that's a short. Yeah, no, I think I think you're spot on there. The, the people don't realize the. It's also a psychological thing that's going on at the moment. Um, people don't realize the subconscious stress that they are actually under, and that psychological part is going to be 
far worse than the virus. We've got one question here. What are your thoughts on the new proposed fire and amusement tax? I've got no okay, idea. I've never um, even heard about that. Yeah, I haven't heard of that. I know there are, there are some taxes that are being considered. Uh, let me just make one or two comments about taxes. The, the one tax is the so-called wealth tax. I don't think we're going to see a wealth tax, uh, at least not yet. And the reason is because it's extremely difficult to implement the wealth tax, and it takes a long time to implement the wealth tax. The Minister of Finance did mention that there will be some, wealth, uh, some tax increases, so I expect the normal tax increases. The only place where you can really get sub substantial amounts of money or more money will be a VAT increase, but that is going to be politically very difficult to do. But the Minister of Finance did indicate the so-called solidarity tax, uh, which will mm. probably obviously be levied on, um, on wealthy individuals. It's probably going to be a once-off kind of thing, uh, but some of the other taxes are probably going to be increased as well. I haven't heard of a fire tax or an amusement tax, but there's a solidarity tax. I'm, I'm aware of that. Sure. Then we've got another one, Darby. The JSE is performing relatively well, but it is clear this is not the reflection of the real performance of the economy. Many small businesses do not have cash and many will close. The government support uh, they receive is actually debt. Uh, what gives you? Are we in for a massive crash? Or what are we in for, Darby? So, yeah, that's what you learned earlier. Yeah. Thank you. Let me give you some interesting numbers, uh, American numbers. There's an index called the, the S&P 500. It's the 500 biggest companies in the United States. Now, the S&P 500 is currently at record high levels. And on all, all, on, at all metrics, all ways of looking at it, it's too expensive. They, so the American markets are too, too high. Uh, but, this, but here's a very interesting thing. If you look at the, the, S, the, the 10 biggest companies in the world, they are typically Amazon and Alphabet and Microsoft and those sort of things. The 10 biggest companies in the world, by the way, their market cap is bigger than the GDP of Germany. I think the four biggest companies, their market cap is bigger than the GDP of Germany. Anyway, but the point I want to make, if you take the 10 biggest company in the S&P 500 out of the index, the S&P 500, or actually the S&P 490 then, is actually down uh, for the year, and substantially so. Uh, so what we have seen internationally, it's typically tech companies and big companies that have seen this huge increase in prices. And of course, they are typical companies that, can, that do and can react. Uh, to this um, monetary policy stimulus that we've experienced internationally. So that is what's happening internationally. Locally, what is going to happen, what I believe is that you have to understand that South African companies uh, on the JSE, we've got a, just about, <laughs> about, about 100 companies in South Africa pay about all the company taxes in South Africa, just about all of that. And they are big companies and they are listed and they typically, typically the bats of this world and Richmond and those sort of companies and they are international companies. So they do a lot of business locally but they, they do a lot of business internationally as well. And more than 60% of the JSE is actually earned internationally. Now, that's sure. a good thing. I think. It's, a, it's a good thing because, uh, of course, um, we earn a lot of foreign exchange by our companies doing business internationally. But the bad thing is, and this is what's happening currently, is that the local economy, the domestic economy is in, in big trouble. And therefore, companies are not paying a lot of company taxes. And the other taxes are also down. But the, the, the same also affected by the global economic slowdown, which mm. was, um, so the, there's a double whammy for our companies. They earn money locally and internationally. Having said that, I think our companies are okay priced uh, and we, we believe that the JSE is actually quite cheap. So if anything, the JSE is actually very cheap compared to some of the international companies. So, but of course we, we follow the international trends. If the international trends are for uh, equity markets coming in, coming under pressure. South Africa will follow as well, but the South African markets are actually quite cheap. Uh, and um, the South African bond market, the capital market, is in fact very, very cheap compared to internationally. Um, so yes, it's quite possible that the JSE can, can go through a significant correction, but I don't think it will necessarily be triggered locally. I think it will be triggered internationally. Sure. Yeah, and I, um, I see there's another question well, the modern money uh, theory or the modern money tree, uh, okay. if you can repeat that explanation. And then what do you think about, can't governments now destroy this private money or digital money as well if they're over-regulated? 
Yes. Okay, the uh, modern monetary theory of the magic money tree. In, in, in simple terms, uh, today what happens is the central bank creates money out of nothing, and then this money is being made more through the, the fractional reserve system. That's how it works. Central banks affect this or they try to influence this by increasing or reducing the price of money. Uh, and in the case of South Africa, we call it the repo rate or the repurchase rate. And the Reserve Bank always forces everybody, the last rant is always in the Reserve Bank. And that's the reason why we always have a money market shortage. The shortage is always borrowed from the Reserve Bank. Bank's main instrument is interest rates, whereby they increase or reduce interest rates. If they see people borrow too much money, they make money more expensive and vice versa. So that's how it works in the modern economy. Uh, modern monetary theory basically comes down to the following. You do the same. You also want to check inflation. If inflation becomes a problem, okay, let me start from the beginning. In modern monetary theory, you do not need taxes. You don't tax your population. That's the theory. You don't tax the taxpayers anymore. Simply what you're doing, if you need money, you print more money and you spend this money. But if you see that inflation becomes a problem, then you spend less. You can still have normal monetary theory as well, and you, maybe you can even have some taxes as well, but the bottom line is, is that you print more money and you keep on printing more money until you have an inflation problem. And the moment you have an inflation problem, then you print less money. So the government, you print the money and you give it to government to spend the money. That's what you do. That is a modern monetary theory. And in fact, it is being implemented. The British are doing exactly that. The Brits have a bank, have an account, their government's got an account at the, at the Bank of England and they spend money directly, fresh money that's being printed by their central bank. And that is a form of modern monetary theory. So that's the difference between the two. And, it's a, and it is very much a slip, it's very much a, a gray area because central banks by printing money through the process called quantitative easing is in a way doing a version uh, of this modern monetary theory. But anyway, sure. it comes down to you simply print the money and you stop doing that once inflation becomes a problem. In simple, in simple terms. So yeah, the two more questions that I see in the text box. One is um, the chances of governments actually destroying the digital or private money or crypto uh, by yeah. over-regulating it. Um, yeah. Yeah, I don't know what's your take on that. Okay. Okay, let me give you an example. Um, uh, Bitcoin is illegal in Russia. Mm. I think you guys are aware of that. Yeah. It's illegal. Now, I have sent Bitcoin to Russia and I've received Bitcoin from Russia. And I did that because I wanted to, to see if I could. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <laughs> so the, yeah, so the point, the, that answers the, the question, point, actually. <laughs> the, 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 the point is, the point is, is that, uh, that due, to the, due to the, you can send, you can send messages to any place in the world, as long as that individual has got, um, got uh, access to the internet, you can send messages anywhere, uh, yeah. to a subtronic uh, instrument. I think what is important to understand is that money today, remember if I do a transfer from bank account A to bank account B, the, 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 the bank manager doesn't run with a little briefcase and take it from one bra branch to the other one. He simply sends an, a message. Mm. Today, I, um, the definition for money is money is anything that is generally accepted as money. I was That's just about to say that. Yeah. So if yeah. you, if you're willing to accept my pen as a payment, then I can pay That's you in money. pens. Yeah. So money is anything that's generally accepted as money. And, and today money is in the form uh, of, of informa is in, simply information. And I would like to propose another definition uh, for money. And that is money is anything that is generally accepted as money, especially in a modern environment, money that is pre represented uh, in the form of information. So basically money today is information. And think a little bit about that. Money Ones is not zeros. information. And money can have many different forms. I can, for example, use my, my cell phone and tell them I'm prepared to use this as money. I can exchange this, my, this information about the cell phone and in exchange for something else, or I can exchange my services. I can sing a nice song for you, and that can also be digitized in a way. Uh, mm. and remember, go back to the explanation I had about notes and notes that central banks create out of nothing. 
and um, government debt instruments that governments create out of nothing. Both actually is a form of money. They're pretty much the same thing. And by the way, if I list a company on a JSE, that is also a form of money because I can create new um, shares and sell it to the public. And that's what we've done. I was a director of a listed company for, for many, many years. And that's why companies list because they can literally print, print money because they issue and there's nothing but printing of money in a way. So money is basically information. Uh, and of course, money is anything that's generally accepted as money. And then what do you think of physical gold and sil silver? Hold it, flog it. I must tell you, yeah, I must tell you, I'm not a great fan of gold or silver of these metals. And the reason I'm not a fan of that is because if you put a, a piece of gold in a, in a safe and it, in a year's time, if it's still there, it's still going to be one piece of gold. So physical gold and these um, metals, the reason I don't like it is because it doesn't give you any return and it only costs you money because you need to look after it. Uh, but but there are reasons. Sometimes I think there are good reasons why you would want to buy it in a physical form. One good reason why you want to buy gold is you have, if you see very high levels of um, um, dollar inflation, which we don't have yet, it may come. Then if we see 10, 20, 30 percent in dollar inflation, then the gold price is going to rocket. So then a, that's a good reason why you want to have gold. Another reason why you want to have gold is if you want to run away put it in a pocket and jump on a plane. That's a valid reason. Another reason is maybe for some sentimental reason, because I don't know, people just like it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, a very important reason is if you can use it to seduce women. That's another <laughs> reason. Apart, apart from that, I can't really think of a very good reason why I want to have gold. No, I don't like gold. All right. And then uh, I see that's the last question. Uh, looks like it. Your thoughts on the house prices in the near and longer term property yeah. i don't think it's i think it's different house property is more uh, just property and not commercial side and I, yeah i'll quickly i'll quickly touch on that i think there are two aspects to that the one is that the traditionally the biggest driver of property prices in south africa was interest rates so with interest rates very low now that is supposed to support property prices but it's not doing that because of the People are very scared and people do not want to buy property now. Eventually, and especially when we start seeing inflation, property, by the way, usually keeps the, it's usually quite a good edge against inflation. So I believe property prices will eventually start going up. But for now, people are just too scared. In fact, if you want to buy property, perhaps now is not a bad time. And just by the way, don't, don't fix your interest rates. Okay, that's always a question that I get. So don't fix your mm. interest rates. Uh, but but another comment, so that's one comment about property. Another comment about property, I believe in future people are going to uh, work differently. <coughs> Apologies for that. <coughs> ah, I believe. Are you okay? <coughs> I'm, I'm fine, thanks. I believe in future people are going to work differently. Mm. And people have different kinds of properties. Like... Um, <clears throat> I work from home and I want some, some uh, swimming pool and I want to have a nice place to come back to, well, to work from. So and I believe that is actually going to support property prices. The, the, the future somehow is going to be different in a way that we work, in a way that we want to stay at home. We want maybe a more luxurious uh, uh, work environment, which is going to become our, our, our houses in many instances. So I think that is likely to affect property prices as well, positively. House prices, a re, a, yeah. a, a retail property, uh, I think, is in for a highly <clears throat> commercial property, generally speaking. Okay, um, why would you not fix interest rates? Because you fix it at a higher level, at than a current level, firstly, and secondly, yeah, and it can only three years. Um, and remember, banks also have um, economists working for them. Uh, there's a question about pension funds, yes. Uh, uh, pension funds, I believe, well, they've, I think it's inevitable. If uh, I do a lot of work on fiscal accounts, and maybe one day we can talk about that as well, Dival. Yes, but I can please. tell you, they are so, so deep in trouble. They are so deep in trouble, the fiscal accounts. We are, we are in a crisis. I want to repeat mm. that. We are in a crisis on the fiscal accounts. We, the taxpayers cannot, pay this, this, cannot carry this burden anymore. They've consumed the capital, this government. 
I am referring to, to mm. and to South African Airways and all that. And the only th the only thing that's left is the, the pension funds. So I'm afraid I think that's a reality. It will eventually become become well, that will be yeah. that will be a good good topic maybe to discuss, especially more for the South Africans, the global global markets. Yeah. I'm not sure if they will, but. Um, where's the state of South Africa's economy? Because there's no way they can pay back the debt. And where does that leave us as local citizens? But I think that's a topic completely on its own. Um, any other questions for Darby? Otherwise, we're going to jump. What will the significance to citizens of swap line eligible countries versus other country citizens? Okay, that's over I my head, Jim. Sorry. I think, I think what, uh, what it means there is um, I think it's a foreign exchange control question there. I think so. Uh, well, the, if that is the case, then uh, forex controls will typically be applicable only be on South Africans and not on foreigners. So foreigners can bring their money in and out. It's not going to be a problem. But no, it's not I, that it's, I, I think that's the question. Yeah, I had talking about foreign money and there's lots of, there's quite a few foreigners on here. Um, one of the business partners is laughing at me when she finds out how much rent I'm paying and what it's in, in dollar value. They can't believe it. So yeah, it's a, quite a lack of place to invest, I think, coming in with dollars and euros. Um, yes, a yes, about the, yes, the question about the S&P, something I forgot yes. to mention. Don't, don't think that you need a growing economy to have uh, equity prices going up. There are many examples in history where equity prices go up despite economies being in recessions. Uh, and remember, equity markets are forward-looking. So what they are doing today, they are discounting future economic growth. And uh, so you, you find, like what we're currently finding, is that the equity markets are up, but the economies are down and down quite a lot. But eventually, it needs to catch up. And eventually, you need economic growth to, to maintain those kind of values. Uh, when the S&P is going to crash, it's not only a function of uh, the U.S. economy or of the economy, but it's also a function of what central banks will do to support that. So if central banks start buying equities, if the Federal Reserve buys, starts buying equities in, in the U.S., then they can keep those prices going up and up and up forever. And the only thing that can stop that party then will be inflation. Awesome. No, thank you very much, Darby. This was, as always, very insightful. Um, I don't see any more questions. I don't know if there's anything last bit that you want to leave the people uh, with a thought of, well, we're in okay. trouble, but there is hope. <laughs> yeah, well, there are a couple of things. I must tell you the South African Reserve Bank is under good management. I think Lesetje Kanyahu is an excellent governor of the South African Reserve Bank. He's reduced interest rates quite a lot. He's even tried his hand a little bit on quantitative easing. He doesn't, he calls it something else. Uh, but the, the South African Reserve Bank uh, is in the really, really good hands. But I'm afraid the pressure is going to keep on building up on the Reserve Bank. And we're going to really see pressure on the Reserve Bank in two years' time. But at the moment, the Reserve Bank is doing a good job. The South African financial markets are very liquid, very well integrated. It's, it's been very, very attractive at the moment. But be very careful. That's part of the reason why the RAND can actually appreciate because of our very attractive bond market especially. The RAND is very, very weak. That's a good thing. Because if it is very, very weak, the chances are it's not going to go much, much weaker. Well, it can always, but I think over Be time, we're depreciating. Yeah. yeah, just a last comment. Last comment, if anybody, wants to, if anybody wants to get my newsletters, I write every now and again something. Send me an email, and uh, I'll put you on my distribution list, and you can get my newsletters. And then also, if you need something on... Uh, to assist with your investments locally and internationally, that that's why we'll do that with pleasure as well. Yeah, Darby. you're welcome. Welcome to put your email address there in the chat box, uh, Darby, for those who. Okay. Uh, Here's don't my email have address. It. Sorry, Alex, you had a question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I uh, might, uh, might have the last question for Davi. Um, uh, Davi, what do you think about uh, that <clears throat> the Fed is buying all that equity in the US? Because I think they cannot keep this up for forever because that will scare out the private shareholders if they keep issuing shares uh, because in the same time they devalue the shares that they're actually holding. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. It must come to an end somewhere. Uh, and I must tell you, I'm actually, I, I would have thought that it would have come to an end already. And I think there's something that we are missing. And I yeah. think that 
thing that we are missing is that economies globally, although economies are going through a very difficult time at the moment, but I've got a suspicion that economies are actually bigger than what we think. Because, uh, because let me give you a simple example. I read an article that the average American, that Google is worth approximately $500 to the average American. But if you Google something, it is for free. You get it for free. But it's not, it's not captured in any economic data anywhere. So they, there must be economic activity going on that we are not aware of. So maybe I'm wrong. Maybe this debt levels that are very high internationally is a problem, but perhaps because economies are bigger than what we think, it is perhaps less of a problem. I have calculated that my personal productivity at least doubled since I've started using a cell phone. And uh, so that, those are the kind of things that I think economists simply do not have enough insights in yet. I think, uh, so, the <laughs> best I can yeah. do is just speculate, but I think economies yeah. are bigger. And if economies are bigger than what we think, then everything I've said is out of the window. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, no, so uh, I was also wondering, um, like I said, I also uh, share the opinion that it has to come to an end, and it should have actually already, yeah. And um, yeah, like, like you said, I, uh, um, yeah, I was hoping that you might have the answer what I'm missing in the picture. No. <laughs> right. there's, a of, there's a question of fear of post inheritance tax. That's a very, very silly idea. Inheritance tax, you can just as well abolish it because inheritance tax also is, uh, is also known as a voluntary tax because I, that's my job. I, I assist people with taxes as well and people do not pay taxes. Like if you pay inheritance taxes because you haven't planned properly, no, it's not mm. going to happen. Yeah, just a question there. What is your, how do they get onto your newsletter? Um, Send me an email. There's my email address. I've put it there. Send me an email. I'll put you on my distribution list. Okay, great. No, thank you very much, Darby. Really appreciate your time again. Um, and for everybody out there, yes, it is tough times and you need to start thinking outside of the box. Um, we can debate all these things. There's not much you or me or we can do about it other than thinking outside of the box and finding alternative ways. Thousands and thousands of jobs are being lost. Companies are closing down. And what do we do to make that money up? The money is there. You just need to figure something out in getting your hands onto that money. And that's what we do in Huddle Knots, Trendsick and Tell a Friend is we teach people how to use crypto, trade crypto. And it's we've got literally housewives, single moms, uh, sophisticated businessmen, and whatever that is part of our community and trading with us. So make sure you learn. Don't give your money to scams or get rich quick scams or whatever the case is. It does not work. You're going to somewhere fall out of the bus short term maybe make a bit of money but in the long run you're going to lose all of it so rather teach yourself a new skill and understand what crypto is or like darby said uh digital money or and and how you can utilize it to your benefit any case so for those who are interested uh again darby thank you we are now going to jump into the market update uh Trendsick team is going to take us through what Bitcoin and Ethereum is doing and what we can expect the next couple of days. And then we'll do a quick catch up what's happening around the world in COVID. See if Jen is here, Finn and Bijan, what's happening in the States, in Asia, and so forth. Darby, again, thank you. You're welcome to stay on, or I know you're a busy man, or um, we'll speak to you real soon. No, I think he's off already. He was already gone. All right. All right, y'all. Thank you for joining us. Alex, Jacques, what's happening in Bitcoin? Yeah. So let me get you to Bitcoin. Let's change the time frame. And it's a little bit smaller. Yeah. So what happened over the weekend in Bitcoin <clears throat> was something that I did not count on. And that